Good evening from New York. I'm Chris Hayes. The Labor Day holiday is over. It's the first Tuesday of September. The first Tuesday of November is Election Day, and so that means, yes, it's happening, America. We are two months out, 63 days to be precise, which means the sprint is on to the finish. And Republicans are getting very, very nervous about one thing in particular. Party leaders on Capitol Hill are warning their top donors privately and publicly in panic tones they need more money to compete with Democratic spending. The head of the Republican Party's Senate campaign is telling Politico, the only thing preventing us from having a great night in November is the massive financial disparity our party currently faces. Now, let's be clear here. It's a fundraiser's job to sound panicked and ask for money. Maybe you've seen that in phone texts you've received. Democratic donations have been through the roof in every election cycle since Trump became the face of the Republican Party, understandably. But this race, it looks different. And in this case, it does look like some of the panic is warranted. Here's why. We don't have a full August fundraising tally yet from both campaigns. But in July, the Harris campaign raised $310 million, more than double the $138.7 million Trump raised in the same period. And the spending gap between the parties has rarely, if ever, been as big as it is today. Look at these key battleground states where the situation for Republicans is so stark. Look at those numbers. Pro-Harris groups are spending roughly 10 times as much as pro-Trump groups in buying political ads in Michigan, Nevada, North Carolina, and Wisconsin. Three times as much in the state of Arizona. And that's all according to political data analysis from the firm Ad Impact, which tallies these ad buys on television. That is a colossal spending disparity you're seeing right there. It's the kind that might make a difference in a tight election, right? There are, however, two state swing states where, despite their huge disadvantage right now in fundraising, Republicans are keeping face, pace with Democratic spending. And I think this tells you something about where this race is going to come down to. So those would be the states of Georgia and Pennsylvania. Look at those numbers, right? So in those states, pro-Trump groups seem pre prepared to be outspent, outspent everywhere else that's in play, but not in Georgia or Pennsylvania, where they're matching pro-Harris spending almost dollar for dollar. Now, the reason, of course, for this is the Electoral College, the bizarre anti-democratic system of presidential voting that says no matter how many people vote for you for president, you still need 270 state electors. It's a system that's already caused enormous problems in America, like when George W. Bush and Donald Trump both lost the popular vote but won the Electoral College. And of course, don't forget that in 2020, it was the perverse incentives and the complicated machinery of the Electoral College that provided Trump with the opening to try and steal the election with, among other things, his plan for fake electors, a plan that culminated in the January 6th insurrection, right? That was the day that the Electoral College votes were going to be tallied, right? The Electoral College is still there. It's in the Constitution, operating in the background, and every single strategic decision both campaigns make are determined by it. And what you're seeing in the spending, the Trump campaign, I think, they've got one main path to victory that they appear to be putting literally all their money on, and that is basically this map. Envision this result. It's pretty much the same as 2020, except... So everybody holds the states their parties won that year in 2020, except Donald Trump flips two states. He flips Georgia, which, of course, Joe Biden famously won by 11,000 votes, and he flips Pennsylvania. That gives him 270 electoral votes to 268 for Kamala Harris. Under that scenario, Trump becomes president again. Kind of a nightmare map for the Democrats, to be honest. Harris could sweep the rest of the battleground states, and she could win nationwide by millions of votes. Four million votes, five million votes, six million votes, wouldn't matter. As the Washington Post pointed out today, if Trump can hold North Carolina, the only one of these seven states he won in both 2016 and 2020, and he takes Georgia and Pennsylvania, that's it. He wins. It's over for Harris. Now, that path, that map, uh, is a high-risk, high-reward strategy for Republicans. And again, the reason we're talking about this specific path is that ad spending we showed you at the top of the block, right? But what's very clear is that Pennsylvania is like just absolutely crucial, pivotal for them as you might have gathered from Trump's last few rallies there. When I'm back in the White House, America's future will be built right here in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is always a big factor. We've had great success, as you know, politically and otherwise in Pennsylvania. The workers of Pennsylvania, 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 Pennsylvania. This is a very consequential vote in Pennsylvania because they say that 
if you win Pennsylvania, you're going to win the whole thing. We cannot let these people. We cannot let these people win Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is almost as crucial for Harris as well. Certainly, if she wins there, right now she leads in the polls, but it's within the margin of error. And of course, I think it's fair to say all these states are going to be very close. If she wins there, she's in good shape. She can also win in some long shot scenarios without Pennsylvania. For example, she can hold Georgia and then flip North Carolina, which again, a Democrat hasn't won for quite some time. But for both campaigns right now, the Keystone State looks like a true Keystone to victory. And that's also borne out in the campaign visits this week. Harris and President Biden rallied in Pittsburgh on Labor Day, with the campaign saying Harris will return there on Thursday. Harris's running mate, Tim Walls, is beginning his own solo trip to multiple parts of the state of Pennsylvania, including Lancaster on Wednesday. Even Doug Emhoff, first gentleman, is expected to campaign in Allentown, Pennsylvania this week. Trump, meanwhile, is expected in Harrisburg tomorrow to film a town hall with Sean Hannity of Fox News, of course. Beyond that, he has no major public campaign stops scheduled for this week. I'm a two-time Trump voter. In 2024, I cannot support Donald Trump. Trump is 100% responsible for January 6th. His treatment of women is just disgusting. Trump called servicemen suckers and losers. If Trump has a second term, it will be much worse than the first. Kamala Harris is a prosecutor. He's a convicted felon. In 2024, I will be I will be I will be proudly voting for Kamala Harris. Republican Accountability Pack is responsible for the content of this advertising. Starting today, that that message will be broadcast to voters in Pennsylvania and Michigan and Wisconsin and Arizona and Nebraska. There are also these billboards, which will blanket those key swing states as part of an $11.5 million ad blitz funded by the political action group Republican Voters Against Trump. Joining me now is the founder and executive director of Republican Voters Against Trump, as well as the publisher of The Bulwark, Sarah Longwell. Sarah, it is great to see you. I am so eager to hear more about the project. And really specifically, because you know better than most people, who exactly is the sort of target audience here? Is this the vestige of the Nikki Haley coalition? Can you give me like a profile of the kind of voter you guys are going for? Yeah, so on, on one level, it is the vestige of the Nikki Haley voter. The fact is, some of those voters uh, were already Biden voters last time. Some of them were going to go home to Trump. And then there's kind of that group that prior to uh, Joe Biden dropping out, we were calling the double haters. And these people, they really do hate Donald Trump, but they thought Joe Biden was too old. And the thing about these voters is they're kind of right-leaning independents and soft GOP voters. They don't identify as Democrats. And that's the tough part. That's where you've got to build a permission structure for people like this who just do not see the Dems as their natural tribe to say, you know what? I am so tired of Donald Trump. I'm so over the lies about the election. January 6th was a red line for me. Abortion is now a primary issue for me. Any, any sort of combination of those things can drive that voter to say, this time I'm out on Trump. But one of the things we did with this campaign was we specifically went and found hundreds and hundreds of people who had voted for Trump. Everybody who is part of our campaign voted for Trump at least once. Uh, many of them have done it twice. And I think it's important for people to understand that these voters, um, there are a lot of people who kind of held their nose and voted for Donald Trump for whatever mm. reason, but they weren't wild about him. And January 6th was really the thing that pushed them over the edge. And the fact that the Republican Party decided that they're going to go again with Donald Trump. There's just a lot of these voters that are that say this is too much. And then once you gave them somebody sort of new, like Kamala Harris, they basically were like, you know what? I'm in. I'm in for the optimism. I'm done with the doom and gloom. Uh, and they were ready to come out and be advocates. And those people can create the best kind of permission structure for other people who are on the fence, who are kind of looking for a reason to vote against Donald Trump. They're not that comfortable voting for Democrats, but when they see people from their own tribe, people who made the same decisions they have in the past, who voted for Donald Trump, say, you know what, I can do it with Harris, I can go ahead, I can vote for her. Uh, that's the kind of thing that helps people sort of make that move. Can we talk a little bit about the strategy behind the campaign itself? I mean, I know you guys are going up in, with these billboards, at least, in major metro areas and key swing states. Pittsburgh, Harrisburg, and Philadelphia, and Pennsylvania. 
Grand Rapids and Detroit and Michigan, Madison and Milwaukee and Wisconsin, as well as Phoenix and Omaha for Nebraska's second congressional district. And my Lord, do we hope this election does not come down to that one electoral vote. Um, you said that these are folks who don't feel like they're part of the Democratic tribe. But when I think about all of those metropolitan areas, I sort of think of them as Democratic strongholds. Can you talk to me a little bit about how, I mean, sort of, are these people that are just reluctantly hanging out in blue areas of these swing states? No, this is a this is a great question, actually. Um, so in most of these, these are the we, what, what are called DMAs, right? These are the places where you advertise, uh, and that's that's what. Uh, how do I explain this to you? So, the, yes, it's the name of the cities, but where we are concentrated in our advertising is really in those suburban areas that ring those those cities, ah. because that is where these persuadable voters are. You're talking about. Bucks County, Pennsylvania. You're talking about Cumberland County. But in order to reach those voters, you often have to go into the DMA that is the biggest city in that area. Um, and so our focus is not to hit those uh, those blue voters uh, that are concentrated in the metropolitan areas, but really in the rings around there. And we're doing what's called a surround sound campaign. And so not only are we up on television, but we're very narrowly targeted with digital, with something called uh, CTV, which is on your Hulu uh, and other places where you stream or on radio. And so we really are trying to hit people with a lot of different voices, um, but all of whom are sort of a lot of these college educated suburban voters who have been the persuadable voters that have made up the margins uh, in the last uh, couple key, uh, key elections. I got to ask, because, you know, Chris Hayes was talking about this, and rightly so, in the last hour, and I've been thinking about this a lot. I know Nate Silver's been thinking about it a lot. Pennsylvania. It seems like this is the, I mean, as it was in 2020, um, Pennsylvania has 19 electoral College votes, it's a big deal. Um, everybody wants to win it. And by everybody, I mean Kamala Harris, Donald Trump. How much work do you think needs to be done in that state on the part of Democrats? I, I'm noticing you, you are going up with these billboards in three cities in Pennsylvania. Yeah, Pennsylvania really is the tipping point state. Um, you know, I was <laughs> I was originally kind of a big advocate for choosing uh Governor Josh Shapiro uh, as the VP candidate, because I thought in such a utilitarian way, it is so important to lock up Pennsylvania. Uh, you know, I don't think Tim Walls was a bad choice. I just there's just nothing more important than Pennsylvania. And, and I think you can see uh, in terms of Trump spending and in terms of Harris's spending, that's what everybody's battling over. And it is a state that has a lot of these um urban areas that then do have these suburban rings around them. And a lot of those uh, suburban rings are the kinds of places that have moved from red to blue over the last decade that Donald Trump has been on the scene. Like, that is where the voters are moving. They are politically realigning out of the Republican Party and uh, are becoming more willing to vote for Democrats. These are people where previously they would vote for John McCain and Mitt Romney. Uh, but Donald Trump has been pushing them out of the party. But it also has a lot of these rural areas, uh, mm -hmm. which is where I grew up in central Pennsylvania, where Donald Trump dominates with voters. And this is why it is so important. I think you got to get Tim Walls to these rural areas. Uh, you got to have him talking directly to voters. Uh, but yeah, Pennsylvania is the ballgame. We're going to spend a ton of money there, but so is everybody else. Yeah, to say the least. Sarah Longwell, a wealth of information, uh, founder of Republican Voters Against Trump, of course, publisher of The Bulwark and all its must listen to podcasts. Thanks for your time, Sarah. Really, really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. But we begin tonight with the beginning of the final sprint toward November. Happy back to school day if you're a parent of youngins or college kids. And if you're not a mom who literally birthed children out of your body without ever having used fertility treatments or adopting or becoming a stepmom, J.D. Vance would like to have a word with you. But seriously, we are now three days from the start of early voting in North Carolina. Mail ballots go out there on Friday. And we are just 63 days to the final voting day, November 5th. Monday was Labor Day, a holiday to celebrate the American labor movement and American workers. And the two presidential campaigns spent it in markedly different ways. Vice President Kamala Harris and her running mate, Minnesota Governor Tim Walz, held Labor Day events in Michigan and Wisconsin. Vice President Harris later joined President Joe Biden in Pittsburgh talking about the contributions of working people. You tell me 
Who in Wisconsin is sitting around saying, damn, I wish they'd give billionaires tax cuts and screw me over. I wish they would make my job more difficult, more dangerous. And then at the end of the day, I wish they'd make me work till I'm 75 years old. No one's saying that. No one's asking for that agenda. Wall Street did not build America. The middle class built America. And unions built the middle class. That's a fact. Everywhere I go, I tell people, you may not be a union member, but you better thank unions for that five-day work week. When unions are strong, America is strong. The Harris-Waltz campaign is continuing to build on its momentum, shoring up support with voters in key states on key issues. Surrogates for the Democratic campaign kicked off the Fighting for Reproductive Freedom bus tour in Palm Beach County, Florida, today. Palm Beach County, of course, is also the home of the Republican presidential nominee, Donald Trump. And where was he on Labor Day? Holed up in his Mar-a-Lago resort, presumably golfing, of course. Whatever he was doing, he was definitely missing in action from the campaign trail. And if he's actually serious about running for president, he might want to work harder for his own sake. Hello, prison and many fines. Meanwhile, a Republican official will, quote, no longer have any involvement with the Trump campaign after he sent an email Sunday saying New Hampshire was no longer a battleground state and Trump was sure to lose by an even higher margin than in 2016 and 2020. It is yet another sign that the map is shrinking for Donald Trump ahead of his first debate with Vice President Harris in Philadelphia just one week from today. A series of battleground state polls from Bloomberg found Vice President Harris and Donald Trump essentially tied in North Carolina and Arizona, and the vice president leading within the margin of error in Georgia, Michigan, Nevada, and Pennsylvania. In Wisconsin, Harris leads Trump outside the margin of error. Nationally, a USA Today Suffolk University poll found Vice President Harris with a five-point lead over Trump among likely voters in a multi-candidate field within the margin of error. Meanwhile, the last time Trump actually did work for his campaign, it was just more fear-mongering and demagoguing to MAGA voters at a Moms for Liberty event on Friday. Our country is being poisoned, poisoned, and your schools and your children are suffering greatly because they're going into the classrooms, they're taking the seats, and they don't even speak English. The transgender thing is incredible. Think of it. Your kid goes to school and comes home a few days later with an operation. The school decides what's going to happen with your child. And, you know, many of these childs, 15 years later, say, what the hell happened? Who did this to me? Yeah, okay, okay. First, Donald, that's a lie. <laughs> Full stop. And a, and a dangerous and ridiculous lie. There is no school in America where a child has gone into a classroom and come out having had surgery to alter their gender. There are literally no schools or teachers deciding what's going to happen with any child in any classroom except what's on the lesson plan for the day. So let's just be crystal clear about that, Donald. Like, that's just weird and a lie. But it is yet another reminder of how absolutely unhinged and cognitively impaired, frankly, the 78-year-old Republican candidate is. In fact, if any other candidate spoke that incoherently about anything, we would say they should be committed. If Joe Biden said anything close to that, every major newspaper in America would be demanding that he resign or have the 25th Amendment applied. Stat. But it's Trump, so, you know, it's Tuesday. And you would think his campaign would at least try to do something to stop him from drooling into his verbal oatmeal. But, you know, maybe they're a bit distracted with their own things. And, you know, laying out the groundwork for future careers outside of politics. In fact, here is what their Republican National Committee co-chair, Lara Trump, Donald's daughter-in-law, has been up to. Without your bravery, we're all out of luck. No, this can't be denied. You gotta be special. It takes a lot to put your last in everybody first. Ooh, Taylor Swift, look out. <laughs> Lord Jesus. Okay, I, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I just want to know that while Donald Trump is in litigation, literal litigation with multiple popular artists for playing their music without their permission, he has not, to our knowledge, used Lara's future hits. <laughs> as
at his kooky rallies. Joining me now is the Reverend Al Sharpton, because I need prayer, president of the National Action Network and host of Politics Nation, Jamel Bowie. Opinion columnist for the New York Times and David Jolly, former Republican congressman and MSNBC political analyst. Rev, I'm so sorry. You can either pray for me or answer this question. What is going on with you? You've known Donald Trump a long time. Can I just read you real quick? I just want to read this to you. Well, actually, if you, you want to comment on the music video? Well, I want to <laughs> I want to pray for Laura Trump. I mean, if, if her future is certainly not going to be in the White House, she certainly shouldn't be in the studio either. <laughs> we got to find something for her. Bless her heart. Bless her heart. I, I mean, I love people who have a dream. I am not knocking her having a dream. I'm just saying Simon Cowell used to tell folks on American Idol, this might not be your dream. That you can have a dream, but this might, might, be, this might not be the appropriate dream for you. It might be a nightmare. <laughs> and probably, though, when she looks at how their campaign is unraveling yeah. on her... Uh, Donald Trump, her candidate and relative, has become unhinged. Uh, you said it right. We would be demanding the 25th Amendment if Joe Biden said anything remotely yeah. uh, as, as unhinged and, and, and just totally incoherent as that. But he is going around, still high in some polls, not where he was, because Kamala Harris has certainly uh, unseated him as the front runner. Mm -hmm. But he is certainly still being able to, for other reasons, have this grip on a lot of voters that think this is the only way to bring America back to the days before women had rights and blacks and browns and other people of color had rights. And now he's imagining, hallucinating, that children are being made to change their gender. In school. In school with the instruction of their teachers. And we're acting like this is a serious candidate. Right. Or like this is a serious threat to this country. I think that we are seeing a man absolutely becoming uh, other than his best self. Uh, and, and even his best self wasn't great. But he's, he's lost the ability to even think while he's talking. It just comes out. Yeah. It's like a baby just spitting up. And I think that because of that, even his most ardent followers have to scratch their head. You would think, and the fact that he's even in the 40s is actually shocking, given the, the stuff that he says. And, Jamel, let me bring you in on this. I just want to read this. I'm not even going to play it. I'm going to read this to you, fair audience. And, and Jamel, you did the reason I really wanted you on the show, you pointed out something that is a note for us in the media, that we need to start thinking about this. I'm going to read verbatim what Donald Trump said last week in La Crosse, Wisconsin. Here is the quote. And groceries, food, has gone up at levels that nobody has ever seen before. We've never seen anything like it, 50, 60, 70 percent. You take a look at bacon and some of these products, and some people don't eat bacon anymore. And we are going to get this energy prices down when we get energy down. You know, this was caused by their horrible energy, wind. They want wind all over the place. But when it doesn't blow, we have a little problem. That's what he is saying is called the weave, where he starts out talking about the price of food. He then goes to bacon, which is food, to be fair to Donald Trump. Suddenly, he gets into wind and we have a terrible problem. It, it, there, is, there is no world in which a candidate speaking in that way would not be evaluated by the media as in serious cognitive decline. This is what the media did to Joe Biden for a full year. And he didn't say anything like that. Why are we not having a serious conversation just on a media side about <laughs> Donald Trump's brain and where it stands in terms of his, its health? I think part of it is that Everyone's so acculturated, used to him sounding nonsensical that it doesn't really read as anything particularly different. But I think it does. I think if you actually compare Trump of today to Trump of 2016, there is like a measurable decline. But also, I, I think it's important. I think it's important to emphasize not for voters, for for viewers, right, for readers that that the job of being president is in a lot of ways just managing and prioritizing crises and urgent things. And here is someone who is evidently incapable of staying on a singular train of thought for more than 15 seconds, right? I, I was about to say 30 seconds, but that sounds like quite generous. Mm -hmm. It's 15 seconds. And you can call it a weave and you can describe it as like stream of consciousness, but no, it's, it's just babbling. It's babbling and sort of word association that in the aggregate, you can maybe divine some kind of meaning. But if you're just actually kind of watching it and then as you, as you did, like reading it straightforwardly, like reading a transcript, 
it's it's word salad and it's I think it's it, it indicative of someone who just literally is not capable of being president. And I think that's something viewers and readers need to know. Andrew, let's begin with Judge Hellerstein uh, today, uh, the federal judge in New York, who's the first one to actually issue a ruling based on the Supreme Court's immunity decision. And he said, has absolutely nothing to do with Stormy Daniels. Yeah, well, uh, a judge who I used to appear in front of used to say, I have two words for you, denied. <laughs> um, and this was a repeat motion, as you pointed out, which was there was a motion already that Donald Trump made saying that this case, the New York criminal case should have been, should be tried in federal court, removing it from state courts. Federal court, that was denied by Judge Hellerstein. So this was another Hail Mary. And I think what you really are seeing here is judges who really take their oaths of office seriously for equal justice and are having none of the shenanigans of uh, Donald Trump. It's like, it doesn't matter if you're rich, white, mm -hmm. powerful, you get equal justice, not more, not less. And this was you know, a frivolous argument and it was denied in a cursory fashion and it sends it back to Judge Mershon. As you said, in front of Judge Mershon, there is the issue that is pending of whether the certain types of evidence that the Supreme Court now has said you can't use, whether that sort of severely or sufficiently undermined the trial so he would get a new trial. And assuming that's denied, there's the second issue, which is Donald Trump has a motion pending before Judge Mershon to put off the September 18th sentencing date. So those are the two things that are before Judge Mershon that we're waiting on. And in Washington, in Judge Chutkin's courtroom on Thursday, what are we going to see? Well, we're not going to see anything, but or we will have it reported. To exactly. Us. So um, it, we're back in front of a, an experienced judge, very much like Judge Hellerstein and like Judge Mershon. It's not somebody who's inexperienced like Judge Cannon. There's no sense mm -hmm. of bias one way or the other. Um, what you have is Jack Smith saying, we're ready to go. We can file our brief now. I mean, they literally said, we have the brief, we're ready. So we're ready to sort of move along. So you tell us to proceed, we will go forward. Um, Donald Trump, as you can expect, it's a little like Scheherazade. He's like, you know what, let me just keep on s filing additional briefs and let's just do this seriatim one after another. He doesn't want to see any filings by Judge, I'm sorry, by Jack Smith before the election. I mean, the schedule he proposed is basically, you know, you can you can file after the election and even after the inauguration. So he really wants to see things put off. I don't think that is where Judge Chutkin is going to go. Remember, she has been waiting eight months <laughs> for this case to be sent back to her. And this is a routine scheduling matter. And the Supreme Court has actually said she needs to deal with this. So I see her setting that schedule. Um, and what Jack Smith proposed, which is he's got a brief, he, I could see her saying, yeah, file it, and then giving mm -hmm. Donald Trump time to file his response. And then if it's necessary to have a hearing after she sees the papers, mm -hmm. she can schedule it. But I think she's going to want to see the briefs um, from both sides, so sort of standard procedure in any case, um, and I think that's what she'll do here, treating Donald Trump like any litigant. Is it me or does it feel like every day the Harris campaign honors some new clip of J.D. Vance repeating the same exact offensive ideas about childless women? It's not some gotcha moment. Like, the guy very clearly believes what he's saying. It's, it's not just a few childless cat lady moments here or there. For years, Vance has been appearing on lots of right-wing bro podcasts talking about how women's only purpose on this earth is to give birth to children, and that if these women do not fulfill said purpose, they are both miserable and useless. We're effectively run in this country via the Democrats, via, via our corporate oligarchs, by a bunch of childless cat ladies who are miserable at their own lives and the choices that they've made, and so they want to make the rest of the country miserable, too. If you look at Kamala Harris, Pete Buttigieg, AOC, the entire future of the Democrats is controlled by people without children. And how does it make any sense that we've turned our country over to people who don't really have a direct stake in it? You go on Twitter, and almost always, the people who are most deranged and most psychotic are people who don't have kids at home. There's so many of the leaders of the left I hate to be so personal about this, but there are people without kids trying to brainwash the minds of our children. And Randy Weingarten, who's the head of the most powerful teaching union in the country, she doesn't have a single child. 
If she wants to brainwash and destroy the minds of children, she should have some of her own and leave ours to hell alone. Now, we just got another one. This is J.D. Vance on a podcast in 2021. I'm going to play it for you at length because I think it's really worth hearing the Republican nominee for vice president fully explain this worldview. What elite culture does, what these elite institutions do, is they take some very smart people in our society, they filter them into a very small place, and they basically tell them to want the same things. Clerkships, law firm jobs, consulting gigs, you know, nice cushy jobs at private equity firms. And they tell them that the only way they're gonna be happy is to get those things. And so those people end up focusing on career and on credential at the expense of the things that actually make people happy. And so you have people at Yale Law School, you have women who think that truly the liberationist path is to spend 90 hours a week working in a cubicle at McKinsey instead of starting a family and having children. To me, what it is, is is sort of a value system to replace the fact that they're all fundamentally atheist or agnostic. They have no real value system. Their only value system is achieve in a very conventional way. And so the idea that somehow they're pursuing racial or gender equity is like the value system that gives their life meaning. Clearly this value set has made me a miserable person who can't have kids because I already you know, passed the biological period when it was possible. And I live in a 1200 square foot apartment in New York and I pay $5,000 a month for it, but I'm really better than these other people. What I'm gonna do is project my like racial and gender sensitivities on the rest of them. And like the reason that our society is broken is because these people don't think the exact way that I think, even though the way that I think has made me a miserable person, I just need to make more people think like that. Just the women, you notice. The guys that work 90 hours a week at McKinsey, that's great, I guess. It's no accident J.D. Vance repeated these ideas so often. He was speaking to a specific audience as he auditioned for a role as a future of the Republican Party. And the spot he now holds on the ticket you know, influential people on the right, Tucker Carlson, those in Donald Trump's inner circle, they agree with Vance. It's how he got where he is now. In fact, we have new reporting that shows just how close Vance has been to the creators and visionaries behind the Project 2025 from the very beginning. We'll have more on that next. Donald Trump keeps insisting he and his campaign have nothing to do with Project 2025. J.D. Vance makes that extremely difficult to believe. As the New York Times uncovered back in 2017, the Heritage Foundation, the right-wing group behind Project 2025, put out an equally weird series of essays lambasting IVF and abortion rights, scapegoating the poor, called the Index of Culture and Opportunity. We'll never guess who wrote that introduction to that report and delivered the keynote speech at its public release. What we're less comfortable talking about is this question of culture, and that's what I think is so important about this index and about the conversation we're having today. We're recognizing the importance of culture, and most of all, we're recognizing that it influences the opportunities that children who grew up in the circumstances that I grew up in, that it, that it affects their, their opportunities. Shel Goldberg is an opinion columnist for the New York Times, and she joins me now. You know that we, I remember the childless cat lady comment on Tucker Carlson at the time as being like really gross and offensive, but you could be forgiven for thinking like, oh, he's trying to play up to Tucker. Right. He thinks it's funny. Everybody that says it, something stupid sometimes. Yes, and now it's like every other day. No, it's day, a fixation. It's a fixation. And it's the way that he sort of, it's his go-to insult, right? Because it's it's about different kinds of people. It's about politicians. Oh, they're, I hate them because they're, they're so, they're corrupt because they're childless. They're not invested in the future. It's teachers. It's journalists, right? It's lawyers. It's kind of his go-to expression of contempt is to say that this group of people globally is childless. Yes, and what's striking about it, like in that riff that we played, you know, in the in the previous block, you're right here for it. If you took gender out of it, and you said, look, elite culture just like tells people that oh, the most important thing is like these getting these these you know grabbing the brass ring and working all the time. I'd be like, yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah and like that's not great. And there's more to life than that. But it's always women. Well, it's always know. women. It's women, women, women. Oh, no. Remember, he is married. You know, he's talking about getting these clerkships, becoming a corporate lawyer. I mean, that was his wife. He's until, talking about his wife. Right. Literally until this summer when she, you know, she quit her job after he became the vice presidential nominee. And yes, and he, it is with this sort of, you, it's interesting because when some of the original childless cat ladies comments, he said, well, I wasn't talking about people who can't have children. I was talking about people who choose not to have children. Now he's very explicitly talking about people who can't have children. Right. right? Because he says the, your biological window has closed. Right. And so it's this, um, you know, I didn't read Hillbilly LG when it came out. And so I didn't read it through the filter of 
the discourse at the time. Yes. I read it when he reemerged as a presidential or vice presidential prospect. And that is a book that just seeds with anger, right? And Janie Vance is someone who was very ill-treated by both of his parents. Both of them let him down phenomenally. But the amount of anger that he has at his mother for sort of not fulfilling her maternal role compared to the amount of anger that he has at his, at his father who put him up for adoption, it's just it's a completely different scale. And so, you know, he has this trauma that I think he then projects onto everything around him. He has this volcanic anger. That's a really good point. The, you know, one of the things that, that also comes through here is I think the feminist critique of the anti-abortion rights movement has always been whatever you say about life, you really are just obsessed with controlling women mm -hmm. and women's reproductive faculties and really thinking that that is the sum total of what right. it is, right? That's where value... Here's here's from the the, the, the report on pregnancy fertility mm -hmm. students at IVF back in 2017, right. right? Heritage. Between celebrities having children well into their 40s and companies adding benefits like egg freezing technologies, women are lured into the belief they can have children whenever they are finally ready. However, the biological clock is still alive and ticking when it comes to fertility. These limits need to be discussed in light of the new novel solutions to lure people in thinking they can defer motherhood to fit our own timeline. It's like so <laughs> dripping with contempt. Right, yeah, no, and I like... read that essay. And, um, and she doesn't, she, so the, right, the, the kind of nominal reason for opposition to IVF is because we think embryos are full human beings. Right. And, you know, which is, I think, kind of a, an out there position, but it's, it's the, a the, morally consistent position. Yeah, right? it's the position of the Catholic Church, I should note, yes. Right, whereas this is a, you know, this is just pure sort of like you, this is this is some kind of out. This is some sort of way in which you think that you could circumvent the natural life course that we have decreed for you. And yes, and the whole thing is just so dripping with like this desire to control how other people choose to li live their lives, specifically women, right. about how women live their lives and what's like, should we all go check with J.D. Vance? Like, should everyone, when he's vice president, does every woman have to check? Like, is 25, is it too late? Can I have it? Like, it's not your J.D. business. Like, I find it so weird. Well, I th and I think that people get that, right? That there's yes. this sort of weirdness. I mean, Donald Trump's problem, you know, Donald Trump has his own problem with women, but it's more like his kind of desire to, like, molest and objectify them is irrepressible, whereas J.D. Vance's desire to condemn and control them is what's irrepressible. And people, I think, they get that from him. Yeah, and I, I do think it's, it's interesting to think about the degree to which the Harris... Walls campaign has more like how like are they just like sitting on some enormous podcast stockpile because every day there's a new one. Well, you know, I mean, I've said this on this show before. I still think that we don't pay nearly enough attention to the fact that JD Vance blurbed a book that came out this summer calling for fascism, like literally, you know, praising Francisco Franco and talking about how democracy isn't enough to destroy the kind of subhuman class. I mean, it's this really vicious book. I do think that there's so much jd vance has just done he spent so much time in that netherworld that there is probably an inexhaustible supply yeah and it's also it, that that, that the, the, the final point on this which i think is important is this stuff isn't accidental like him making the tour of podcast bros to go talk about this stuff is not unconnected to him getting the gig Oh, right. Like, that's, that was the audition. Right, that, and that was also his path out of, like, never-Trumpism into the heart of Magadam. Yes. Our friend, veteran Democratic political strategist James Carville is out with a new piece offering Vice President Harris advice on how to defeat former President Trump. He says, quote, 2024 will be won by who is fresh and who is rotten. It is quite simple. The shepherd of tomorrow wins the sheep. While Carville is suggesting Harris focus on her new way forward, Republican South Carolina Senator Lindsey Graham is encouraging Trump to do something he is absolutely not doing. Stay away from personal attacks and focus on his record. I guess he never Trump never speaks to Lindsey Graham because he is certainly not doing that. Joining us now to discuss former lieutenant governor of Wisconsin, Mandela Barnes. Now he is a senior fellow at People for the American Way. And Mark McKinnon is here, former advisor to both George W. Bush and John McCain. What do you think, Mark, of James Carville's advice? Look forward 
Uh, what do you think about what Lindsey Graham is saying? I think it's good advice from both of them. I, I did my first campaign with Carvel 40 years ago, and I've learned more from Carvel than any other anybody else I've worked in politics. He, he's at 80. He's still really good, and uh, and he's not running for president, but he can still be a good consultant. The thing that I think is really smart that he said was that it's, 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 it's been a mistake for Democrats to constantly talk about how dangerous Trump is, because that just feeds his superpower. That makes him bigger. What, what James is saying is laugh at him, and that diminishes him. Just make fun of him. Make him weird. That whole thing is really working, I think. And I think that there's a lot, I think there's a lot of value in that idea. He also makes it very clear that the, the challenge for Harris is that, that she's an incumbent, but she has to be the change candidate. I mean, voters just are constantly That's tricky. Won. Very tricky. Uh, yeah, I mean, she's, she's in a position of saying, uh, uh, it's time for a change, stay the course. <laughs> you know, because she's been the incumbent vice president. But I think she's done a pretty artful job so far of separating herself from Biden uh, respectfully, but coming out with new policies and forging her own way. And this whole freedom agenda kind of separates her from the democracy agenda, which, again, I think is really smart. So I think that she's doing a good job of it, and I think the debate that will be key. Mandela, what do you think? Well, I think uh, he's absolutely right. And the fact is, Donald Trump has been getting embarrassed over and over again ever since uh, Kamala Harris became uh, the nominee, because there's such a distinction uh, between the two candidates. His biggest jabs at Joe Biden just simply do not work with Kamala Harris. And he's having a hard time trying to figure out what lines he can and cannot cross, lines he has typically crossed before. Uh, it seems as if folks like Lindsey Graham's, uh, excuse me, like Lindsey Graham are uh, cautioning him to stay away from them. We'll We'll see how long that lasts. I think a lot of folks are waiting to see the debate uh, to see how far he will take it. But uh, as has been demonstrated over the last month, the farther he goes, the farther people are going away from him and embracing Kamala Harris because of the freshness that was just talked about uh, by James Carville. It's very evident who's fresh and who's stale, uh, who folks want to go with for a uh, new direction for this country, uh, and who they know will take them backwards, which is Donald Trump. Can we go back to what you last said, Mark, that she's out there coming out with new policies and presenting them almost every day? Does she have to do that? Is it a good idea? Because Donald Trump, he doesn't show any policies. It is, because she needs to show separation from Biden. And, that, and that's what's smart. And that's, that's what James is saying, that she has to be the change candidate. She's got to separate from Biden. There's a lot of people that think that she, you know, they're going to they're gonna blame her for the Biden policies that, that she was part of as vice president. So she needs to forge her own path and say, well, listen, you know, I, I, I work for President Biden. I'm proud of the policies we put in place. But people also want to know that she has her own ideas, that she's not just some, you know, just that she was, you know, just second on the, on the, uh, to Biden, that she has her own ideas. And, and that's part of the rap that the Republicans are trying to lay on her, that she doesn't have any of her own ideas. So I think it's very smart. And I think it's a good idea. Trump doesn't have any and hasn't had any since he began this whole thing. Um, the Harris campaign and the DNC are also about to spend an unprecedented amount of money on down ballot races, something like $25 million. And you're actually hearing Republicans in the House and in the Senate starting to panic about this spending gap. Do you think Democrats really have a shot? Well, I, I mean, as the guy who spent uh, $100 million in 2000, 2004 on television, I, I said to the campaign, I think we're wasting a lot of money. So I don't think television advertising helps a lot. But that's why I think it's smart to take that money and do something else with it. Put it in down ballot races. Put it in voter registration. That's where I think the real difference is going to be on the ground with voter registration and new voters. I mean, that's what's going to make a difference. And, and the difference that at least I'm, is being reported, the Democrats are paying people to do it and Trump has volunteers doing it. And I think that'll make a difference in the end. Mandela, what have you been hearing from people in your state, Wisconsin? Do you think Democrats have a shot at taking the House and the Senate? Well, I certainly do. And I think that there is this thing about reverse coattails that we should be real cognizant of, that money that's going to down ballot races. I think about how many folks, and not just congressional races that are contested, but also state legislative races who are just so amazing at messaging, but don't always have the resources to get their messages out there effectively. So if we can prop up those campaigns, if we can activate those volunteer bases and also uh, the staff that they have on the ground to carry the message, one, for those individual candidates, 
but also able to carry water for the entire party. I think it'll do us all a great deal and ultimately help Kamala Harris uh, ascend to the presidency. Now, I just left a group of young folks, the Wisco Project, uh, in Madison, Wisconsin earlier today, and it was a crowd of about 50, uh, 60 young people. And these weren't staff. These were folks who were just coming to campus. This is their first couple days on campus. And what are they immediately doing? They're showing up to get activated to show out in full force this campaign. Two years ago, Wisconsin had the highest uh, youth voter turnout in the entire country. And these are young people who are keen on keeping that title uh, in this presidential cycle. First day on campus and they're registering to vote. Those are different kind of college students than I once. Can I tell you a quick Carville anecdote? Yes. 1984, we did this race, uh, a Senate race, and won an upset primary. Uh, and uh, so after the primary, we moved James from the headquarters to a separate building because he was scaring the interns so badly.